my eye immediately filled up with blood and I was completely blind on that eye. I also drank way too much alcohol at that time, which probably saved my life. Last year, we did about 10 million euros in sales. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Jorg Sprav. Did I pronounce that right? Almost. <laughs> Pretty good. Okay. Jorg has been making YouTube videos about weapons for 14 years. Uh, the Slingshot channel, which encompasses much more than just slingshots, has nearly 1,000 video uploads, uh, about 2.9 million subscribers, and over a half a billion video views. Jorg and I both run GoGun, a weapons company in different countries, Jorg in Germany serving most of Europe and myself in the United States serving all of North America. Technically, they are separate companies, but we share branding and marketing resources and Jorg does nearly all of the product development work in Germany. First of all, on behalf of your fans and myself, thank you for making such great videos. Um, there's something special about the way you approach things. Your inventions are usually made out of pretty basic materials and your videos are not ultra cinematic, but you appear to have such a great time doing it that people can't help but smile. At what point did you realize you have a winning formula? Huh. Winning formula, you have to ask what, what defined winning formula. I knew really early on that I could reach people and that that is new and a lot of people yeah. wanted to see more of that. But, um, you know, then very slowly uh, YouTube started to pay me. And I was actually thinking about when, I, when they sent me the first check, I think it was 80 euros. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought about framing it because I never thought I would make much money of it. So, but then I would say it's around 2014 when the money was getting you know good enough that I would could really see that potentially I could live of it. Mm -hmm. Earlier than this, I was really happy if I could pay my material bills with the money from YouTube. So let's go back. You started YouTube in 2008. Yeah, 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. Started channel 2008, but the first uploads that are still online, I think, date back to early 2009. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. So how many years before you really felt like there was some traction happening and, you know, things are did, like, did you kind of second guess yourself or want to quit at any time or in the early days were you just sort of doing it for fun and you didn't, you know, need to have any external motivation? Yeah, well, it's um, I have to say that in the beginning it was all hobby and it was also an addiction because I mean, if you can, you can watch your numbers develop in real time. And yeah, so when you upload a new video, you see the reaction of people immediately. It's very rewarding to do that. And it gave me a lot of fun and I really enjoyed it. But 2013, 2014, so maybe four or five years later, I was at a point where I seriously saw that that could be my profession one day. Mm -hmm. And so I could quit my old job. That was extremely well paid, but also really stressful. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was when I first saw it. Yes. Let's go kind of back in time and uh, discuss like what all led up to this. So, actually, on your Wikipedia page, it says that you used to sell slingshots to your classmates. Is that? It's true. It's true. <laughs> Would you say that the one of the first things you've sold was a weapon? Absolutely, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Well, maybe I sold a matchbox car to someone before that, but yeah. my first, you know, real business was selling slingshots. Yeah. So I really remember that I was going out into the woods and cutting different tree forks that were suitable. Yeah. And then uh, making slingshots. And I even have a, a little brochure that was handwritten. So all of these things I copied down to paper and yeah. put a price on them. And, and, you know, and then of course people had some options regarding the rubber all made from inner in the tubing you yeah. know? And, and then then that was my only copy so every one of my clients after he bought something I scratched it out and he yeah. had to hand it over to the next customer <laughs> so how old were you when you were doing this I would think I was eight or nine maybe but then then one of my clients used it to um, destroy a window in school yeah. and the headmaster quickly put an end to that business of mine <laughs> uh, that's great I guess, tell me more uh, about you as a kid. Were you sort of a adrenaline junkie or no? I was a, a middle son. Middle yeah. son is, is really 
not a good thing. I mean, at least it wasn't in my family. Yeah. It was like, okay, now the two big boys are mowing the lawn and then the two small boys go to bed. Yeah. You know? <laughs> if you're in the middle, that's not a good position yeah. to be in. And I was also very rebellious. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to do dangerous things. And um, yeah, my parents really didn't enjoy it very much. So I was grounded a lot of times. And um, yeah, so I guess I was more active than my brothers yeah for sure does doing interesting and high intensity things give you some i don't know better perspective on life or appreciation for it or is it just much more simple than that i just think i'm more like a driven person yeah. i have just more energy than many others and yeah. at least more energy than my brothers had I'm not saying anything negative about my brothers mm -hmm. fine guys and both are successful but they're not as driven you know i always i, I hate nothing more than boredom yeah. I hate being bored. Yeah. And therefore, everything that distracts me from that is highly welcome. Yeah. And uh, in my mind, it's always racing. So I always need something to chew on mentally. And I think that makes makes a difference. Yes. Yeah. You went to college and you got a, de well, you got a degree in economics yes. and business. Mm -hmm. So, which is maybe to the surprise of a lot of people who watch your channel and assume that maybe you went for engineering or something. So what were your career aspirations while you were in university well actually i think we need to go back a little further yeah. what what made me going for that just you know studying you know business administration and economics it was actually the fact that i didn't want to go to the military mm. <laughs> so i want at that time I was a judo fighter and I really wanted to go to the Olympics. I wanted nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really care about what came afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, and I had a chance not, not to win and not to win a medal, but, but, you know, make it into the team. And I really wanted to be, I wanted to, you know, live in that Olympic village and, you know, meet all the other athletes and so on. That's really I, what I wanted to do. I worked hard for it and school and so on. I didn't interest me very much. So my grades were, well, very mediocre. Yeah. So, um, and then that was still when we had military duty in Germany. So I was supposed to go 18 months. So they actually wanted to turn me into a Navy guy, you know. Mm -hmm. So they actually, you know, told me that I need to, you know, go and start at the Navy thing that was really far away, like really up in the north of Germany. And we're talking the 80s. So I looked up. You know what kind of clothes I would have to wear as a uniform. Mm -hmm. It looked like Donald Duck. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, it's complete no-go. I can't do that. So I showed up at that, you know, kind of draft center yeah. and said, you sent me this letter and you wanted me to go to the, I mean, but, you know, I, I can't do this. So can we do anything about it? And they said, well, you, you can go and study something and then we're going to pull you in afterwards because then you're obviously more valuable to us. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, and how do you do that? <laughs> so when they said, you got to appeal for it. Yeah. And then I appealed and showed up at that office and that was centralized way back then in Germany. So I said, I want to study something. And he said, what do you want to study? Mm -hmm. And I said, what is left? And he said, well, then show me your high school diploma, like German yeah. equivalent. And he said, not much. <laughs> so, so in the end, he said, you could study business, business administration and economy, you know, economics. Um, and, I, and I said, okay, what well, I'll do that. So, yeah. and I, I did not plan to go and show up a single time. All I wanted to do <laughs> is not go to the Navy. And, um, and then I had a serious motorcycle accident. Yeah. And um, that grounded me for a whole year so I just went back and forth between surgeries and so on mm -hmm. and uh, that kept me thinking about my life what I'm gonna go do gonna do with my life and then I said well you, I have this this place at the university maybe I should just show up mm -hmm. which I did and then I found out that it was perfect for me I loved it I loved every bit about it mm -hmm. so uh, so then uh, I tasted blood and then actually my grades got really good mm -hmm. so uh, so it was then the right thing to do but that was like more like a random effect. It, yeah. I didn't. I never planned to, to study this. Yeah. So. Wow. So you did <laughs> judo fighting. I didn't know that about you. Yes, I was a judo fighter, and not bad. I mean, yeah. as I said, not world class, but but I could have done. You know, I've, I could have gone to the Olympics. That was a possibility. Wow. <clears throat> so I fought in Germany's national team for two years, as a junior. Yeah. So. 
so I had chances. And I still like the judo to this day, yeah. just because, you know, it has the advantage that you're fighting in a team, since mm -hmm. you've got all these weight classes. Mm -hmm. But still, you have a direct opponent. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more satisfying than beating an opponent, you know, same weight class, same everything, yeah. and you beat him, it's, that's the ultimate triumph. Do you carry over any mental frameworks or ideas from judo into business? Is there any lessons that you can apply from judo? Ethics, maybe. Ethics. You know, in, in judo, you have to fight extremely fair mm -hmm. because there's three referees and two fighters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's not much you can do yeah. that goes you know, undetected. Yeah. So, uh, and, but also this, this whole approach, you know, that you've got to fight fair. Yeah. Um, this, I think, I, uh, yes, is there still. And then also one of my ex-judo coaches had a major impact on my life. You know, yeah. I've been, he's been like a replacement father for me. And I think that I'm still very grateful for him for this, you know, for, for the years that we spent together. So, yes, I did learn a lot. And um, I wouldn't say that, you know, there's nothing really practical that I took over. Mm -hmm. And judo, like in a street fight, is useless mm -hmm. <laughs> since there's no referee in right. a street fight. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but I think this mindset and also mm -hmm. to not be afraid, you know, when it comes to confrontation, that is also something that fighters will, will retain. You once told me that your father sort of like left you with a lot of debt through some kind of strange business entity. Can you talk about that and how it pushed you into business? Yeah, well, my father was a businessman too, and he had a sizable operation, like a business with like, I think at the peak, at his peak had more than 100 employees working for him. Mm -hmm. And I never got along with my father really well. You mm -hmm. know, there's actually been months where we wouldn't talk, mm -hmm. and even though I was a minor. Right? What was the business? He did like, uh, heating systems like electronic devices to control heating systems and mm -hmm. so on. So basically electronics, you know, mm -hmm. not as computerized as they would be now, but mm -hmm. but in the like in the early stages of it. Mm -hmm. And he ran that operation and he was always a rich man in my mind, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and always had like big cars and everything. And, um, and then, then you know, he did pay for my university, right? So he which in Germany is not so expensive since the education is basically free. It's just the cost of living that you have to pay. And he did that. And so at one time he approached me and he said he, need me, he needs me to sign up for a company that he wants to start. He said it's something completely new. I, but I personally cannot do it because I have other investors and I have exclusive contracts with them. So I cannot really invest into anything else without them on board too. Mm -hmm. So he said he needs me as a front man. I thought I'm entitled to it, so I signed. And um, I was still a student at the time. And then pretty much the same day when I actually got my college degree, my MBA, mm -hmm. then um, I was informed that my father had completely bankrupted all of his businesses, the one that I signed up for included, mm -hmm. and that I was left with uh, 350,000 German marks of a debt at an age where I was, I was just 23 at the time and I hadn't worked a single day in my life. <laughs> you know, so, and that is, in today's money, it's of course a lot more than that. Yeah. And, it, and it forced me to pay back 5,500 uh, German marks a month for eight years, including all the interest. Mm -hmm. And that was more than I could earn before taxes if I would have gotten a normal job at right. that time. It, and so it wasn't really possible for me to pay this back just being in you know, just being an employee, yeah. working for, I, even though I had some really, really good job offers. Mm -hmm. And therefore I had to start an own business. There was no other way I could ever hope to get out of that misery. So, so that's how I started an own business together with my younger brother, who is a computer genius. You knew that you wouldn't be able to pay off the debt with a normal salary. And so the only r option was to sort of swing for the fences with some kind of new business that you wanted to start with your brother. So right. tell us about what was that business? What were you guys selling and what happened? We're talking the early days of computers, of home computers. Yeah. Way back then, you basically had to decide if you wanted like an Amiga computer 
that's more like colorful and you could play games on it and you could do like a little bit of video work on it mm -hmm. or if you would buy a pc you know like a very early 286 or 386 pc mm -hmm. that ran ms dos not windows at that point one <laughs> so we have, you probably don't remember all this but it was really basic so if you wanted to be creative you got yourself an amiga if you wanted office work you got yourself a, a windows computer like a, or an ibm clone mm -hmm. and uh, we looked at the amiga computers that were extremely popular back then and um, these computers were delivered naked so they needed more ram they needed a hard drive and we designed or my brother designed these products and we we had them made in germany and we sold them then and that was a, a sizable market way back then. It, it really was something that you could make money on. The Amiga computer, they sold a million devices just in Germany. Yeah. One million computers of the same type. You would never see this today anymore. You know, you could never, never from one individual model, nobody sells that many computers anymore. So these days are over. And um, and then yes, we sold them for a long time, and it was it was a bumpy ride. So. We, we always made a profit, but not very much. Mm -hmm. And and then then when we went more into the video editing part of it, that is when success hit that business mm -hmm. big time. So And then my life completely changed. So you're originally selling upgrade kits for Amigas, or you would actually do the upgrade on the Amigas? No, we developed memory boards that you could oh, plug you in. Okay. The Amiga had like expansion boards where you could fit all this in. Okay. And then also hard drives with the controllers, since typically they came with the floppy disk drive only. Mm -hmm. So everybody needed a hard drive. Yeah. And, and uh, that was expensive stuff way back then. A large hard drive in those days cost more than the whole computer would cost today. Right? Yeah. But it easily could happen that you would pay $1,000 just on a hard drive. Yeah. Okay, so then you moved into video editing hardware and software? Pretty much. And you have to think back to the early days of video editing, mm -hmm. where everybody wanted to do video editing on a computer, but few people could. Mm -hmm. Because those were the days where audio and video were never in sync when you edited it on a computer. You could only edit very, very short pieces because the computers really didn't have the throughput for the video quality. And it was very slow. You know, if you wanted to render effects, it would take you forever. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people that did video editing had no clue how to operate a computer. And therefore, what we designed is we designed a machine that looked like a VCR and had the same connector, connectors like a VCR and, and worked on a completely simple mode of operation. So you, it, it, it didn't look and work like a computer at all because the user interface was completely custom and it was made for people that didn't want to learn computers and it was a huge success a lot of people bought this thing and it was also of course optimized for the video editing so the image quality was so much better than on the pcs that were out there mm -hmm. so we we sold a boatload of these devices and it came very 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 suddenly you're selling video editing systems with your brother lots of people are buying these i think at one point you told me it you almost took it public this was maybe like how old were you well, first, first of all, when, when success hit, yeah. that was in the middle 90s, like 94, 95, mm -hmm. 96. Then it turned me overnight from being completely indebted mm -hmm. to being a millionaire. Yeah. You know? I could pay back all those old debts immediately. And then I had so much money that I could you know, do anything that I wanted. I, you know, there was no limit that I could not afford. Yeah. So, and I really lived that. You know, so Millions. I, I spent, I bought, I had a car collection of like classic cars, yeah. American cars also. I had a 1962 Corvette yeah. and a 1953 Cadillac convertible. <laughs> so all these things and sports cars like two Ferraris and, you know, crazy, crazy things. 12 cylinder Mercedes. And, and I had a house in the south of France and I was... For for like several years, I was living like a playboy life. I was yeah. was working a little bit, but not too much because I had people that did it. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time with cars, with with, with cars and, and girls and uh, mm -hmm. and and all things that playboys do. Yeah. And I was still in my thirties, so yeah. it was that was a fun time in my life. But and I thought it would last forever. Yeah. But it didn't. So <laughs> Yes, and it's true. At some point, we wanted to take the company public, and those were the big dot-com years, mm -hmm. you know. So we're talking 98, 99, where 
people would actually flood you with money if you would take a, a successful tech company public. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could have, you know, so we already did all the contracts with the banks and so on. So we have HSBC Bank being our main sponsor and so on. And then we have evaluation of the company by KPMG that put us like a, put like a 400 million euro value on the company. So it, if that would have gone through, it, we, I would have been filthy rich for the rest of my life, really. Yeah. And then before, just a few months before we actually were going public, the bubble burst and the entire tech market completely collapsed mm -hmm. and pretty much disappeared for years. You know, for many years afterwards, the banks would not give you any money if you were a tech company, simply because they burned their fingers really bad. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was, of course, that was not such a nice thing that happened to us. And the company was still profitable. But in order to make it, or to prepare it for an IPO, we had built it, built up a lot of cost. Mm. Since, you know, if you want to take a company public, you have to have like in-house bookkeeping, you have to have like an SAP system running, and everything needs to be just perfect. And we spent a, a ton of money for due diligence, things like legal due diligence, and all this, this comes with it. And I didn't really want to give it up. Everybody thought it would come back. You know, everybody thought it's just a hiccup and then things going to go back. So we kept all these extra costs for like two years. Mm. And then it was too late. You know, I couldn't really get rid of the cost anymore. So, so then the business declined very much, you know, so, and, and without any access to more investors, which yeah. was impossible at the time. Yeah, it, I was faced with a decision to either declare bankruptcy with the business or sell it. Mm -hmm. So what was that like for you to go from, I guess, you know, your company's on an amazing trajectory, you think it's going to be potentially public, you're going to have more money than God, and then to, I guess, have it crumble. And I don't know, what, what changes did you have to make? In life? Did you, were you depressed for years? Like, how did you deal with that? Yeah, that was actually a really miserable time. And I also drank way too much alcohol at that time, which probably saved my life. I have to say that, you know, I, because it made me sleeping, you know, it allowed yeah. me to sleep in the night with, with all these sorrows. And I was so responsible for so many people, you know, that yeah. worked for me. And How I, many people? At that point, we probably were like 45 less left. Yeah. So we, we've been, we, you know, of course, we, we, we already let everybody go that wasn't completely essential. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, we needed to maintain the business running. And, and then it was a really, really stressful time. Mm -hmm. And I only survived it. And it was also uncertain because then we, we, we started to, you know, negotiate with potential investors, you know, for the takeover. Mm -hmm. But that's all, you know, it's, it's, just again due diligences and then they would talk and discuss and then they would come up with an offer and we would negotiate further it was all very unsecure and then we, i perfectly knew that we had this one shot only otherwise it would be complete bankrupt which at that time would have meant that i would be personally bankrupt too mm. so i was really fighting you know with uh, with my back against the wall and I really only survived it because I really drank myself to sleep every <laughs> night. And I had some issues of getting rid of that habit when I yeah. was, when things got back to normal, I really had to force myself to stop doing that. So uh, it wasn't easy, but it was necessary. In Germany, the debt of the company follows the owners much, much more than here in the US, right? Or it's more like it's it's because there was a corporation, that's legally not the case. Mm -hmm. Normally, you know, and of course, as a CEO, you can be made responsible for certain things like criminal behavior and so on. You, you, yes, you can be. That wasn't the case with me. But the thing is that you have at some point you have bank financement. Mm -hmm. And at some point, the banks come to you and tell you we need additional uh, securities, mm -hmm. you know, so we, we need something, some assets that what you have that you can offer to us. And the first thing that they, per they typically ask for is a personal guarantee. Right. And if you deny it, they would say, well, if you don't believe in your own company, how can you expect us to believe in it? Right. You know, so, so in the end, of course, you fight not doing it, but in the end, you sign up for the loan. And this means that you are personally reliable for at least a huge chunk of the debt. Yeah. So, so, and that was my situation. Got so it. I had to, I really had to 
bring this uh, into you know had to had to save the company in order to not lose all this money personally right since a personal bankruptcy in germany way back then was a really big deal yeah now they eased up a little bit on this but mm -hmm. it would have completely finished my career and destroyed you know my income my life basically for the for the rest yeah. of, of uh, my lifespan yeah so, okay. So a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. I see. So because you had pledged your personal assets to get this debt financing, then they you had to give up your personal assets to pay back the loans. Yeah, exactly. So I also had to sell my house that I had at the time. Of course, all the other stuff, like all the cars, were gone long before that, mm -hmm. and the house in France was gone long before that. Yeah. Uh, so because. I was always really transparent with my investors and, and creditors. Mm -hmm. So they all knew perfectly well what was going on. Mm -hmm. And they also saw that I had sold all these personal things and invested it into the company. Mm -hmm. Well, the, you know, the business had paid for it. So now the business needed it back. And of course, it was natural for me to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so that's why. But in the end, when that was over, I was uh, picked clean. But it allowed me to start over, to have a fresh uh, start. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I got out, you know, in better shape than many other, uh, you know, entrepreneurs. They fail in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. So, how did that all lead into YouTube? Okay. Well, that was when when it was getting more and more frustrating in the job, mm -hmm. right? I wanted, I needed something to keep my mind busy. Mm -hmm. Something where I would not depend on other people's decision and on other, other people's work. So I needed some kind of a hobby that had nothing to do with my business. Mm -hmm. So, and the, the slingshots that I, re, I only did this little video about them because we, we're selling video editing equipment and, and YouTube was a new thing and people wanted to know if our output files would be compatible with YouTube's upload which was not standard way back then. In 2008, a lot of the files were not compatible with YouTube. So, uh, so, I, so I filmed myself with a slingshot and uploaded it and made sure that everything worked. That's how, that's how it started. But at some point, I really saw that it was giving me a lot of satisfaction to do something completely on my own that was successful and that had nothing to do with the main business. Mm -hmm. So this is how it fits in. So uh, it, it actually you know, for a long part in my life, like several years, it gave me a lot of satisfaction. Because, you know, when they finally bought the company, it was a condition that I moved down to their headquarter, which was in southern Germany, like four hours away from where I used to live. Mm -hmm. And also I had to start working as pretty much like an employee, which I had never done before in my life. Right. So I never had a boss. Now I am, that was in 2010, so I was pretty much 45 years old. Yes, so at 45 I had my first boss. You became an employee for the first time in your life at 45. I, and that was the most miserable part of my life, I can tell you. I, I it didn't work. Wor worse than kind of the downfall of uh, the company with your brother? That's Very much because the, the, the problem is that then that company that was actually a TV manufacturer, in German TV, luxury TV manufacturer, mm -hmm. producing high-end TVs, mm -hmm. They were immen immensely successful when they bought my company, mm -hmm. but they were already on a downward slope. Mm. And I saw it, of course. I saw what was happening, and um, I tried to warn them. It wasn't really hard to say, to predict what was going to happen to their business. It's that chart technique, you know, you would just prolong the downward trend, and then you would see what happens. So, so I said, but you know, if you keep doing this, you're going to be bankruptcy in a few years by yourself. And they, of course, did not listen to me. They said, yeah, you take care of your business and, you know, you do your job and let us do our job. Mm -hmm. It was very frustrating for me to see that they were doing serious management um, of, uh, you know, errors, failures, destroying this beautiful company. Mm -hmm. And I had, uh, but there was nothing I could do. I could only sit and watch. Mm -hmm. It was really frustrating for me to do that. So... So those were the most miserable three years in my life. <laughs> I really hated them. The darkest days. Yes. Being an yes. employee. Yeah. Okay. So you were making videos on YouTube while you were working for this company that acquired yours. And they didn't like it one bit they didn't because like it. no, because it's Germany is very conservative, you yeah. know, and I was 
after all, I was the managing director of one of the daughter companies, right? Mm -hmm. So I was a little bit of a public figure, not too much, but uh, so they came to me and said, you're doing these videos and making a fool out of yourself. How can you do that? You know, I said, well, I guess it's my right to do that. It's my private life. I'm not doing it during the paid time. So, uh, and at that time I wasn't making any money on it. So I said, it's just my hobby. And I don't think that you have a right to tell me what to do in my free time. Yeah. Uh, well, they hated it very much, but at that point, I didn't care. <laughs> so, and you chose to make videos about slingshots, weapons, because that's what you knew from your childhood, or just the thing that I mean, has weapons just always interested you? Yeah, I was always into weapons. Always. I have to say, I was always very much interested into weapons. But the slingshots, I had slingshots as a kid because my father taught me how to make one. And I loved them, and we spent endless hours shooting them. I, uh, I uh, actually grew up in a very uh, rural place, very much in the countryside, where there's not much else to do than mm -hmm. you know, take your slingshots and then shoot at cans. Yeah. So, uh, and then I got into it just simply because I found a forum on the internet of people that you know had reinvented that hobby, but with much better rubber, mm -hmm. and so they were a lot more powerful than they used to be. And, and it, and it actually sucked me right back in, just like, you know, a lot of people get back into, you know, hobbies that they had as kids, like playing with, you know, toy trains and whatever. So, uh, so that happened to me with the slingshots. And originally, I only did slingshot stuff. But then on YouTube, if you want to retain the uh, attention of the audience, you always have to take things to the next level and the next level and the next level. So I started to make slingshots, but very soon I made huge rubber-powered launchers that launch crazy things like toilet brushes and uh, all kinds of crazy things. Plungers, you know, I did anti-vampire slingshot crossbows. So pretty crazy stuff. And, and, and then, of course, you know, a lot of people thought that I'm completely crazy now. Mm -hmm. And all these things, of course, had no financial background. I was not selling any of these things. It was pure entertainment. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite build you've ever built for your YouTube channel, your, your favorite invention? <laughs> well, you have to divide it a little bit. The most spectacular was certainly the really big bowling ball cannon that I built. Mm -hmm. That was like uh, you know, 15 meters long and 10 meters high. Yeah. And it had a huge amount of 48 metric tons of a draw force in that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I did this with a German TV show and they actually put they gave me two carpenter teams to build it yeah. because it was it was just huge and it was able to shoot that bowling ball really really far. So that was probably my my most favorite yeah. build, but I think the one that I'm most proud of is the is actually the Instant Legolas which is now available as commercial actually two companies are now making commercial products out of it which i think is a revolution for archery i think it is after after more than a thousand years of archery in europe i reinvented it and, and, and turned it into a completely different weapon mm -hmm. so i'm most proud about that one so you ended up starting a youtubers labor union called fair tube uh, with the goal to improve transparency and fairness for YouTube creators against unfair demonetization and banning. Um, what was the impetus for that for you? Why did you start that? The end of the what I call the golden era mm -hmm. for creators on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Like YouTube between 2012 and 2000, 2017 was really paradise. Since you could basically create any kind of content do whatever you wanted to. As long as people liked it, as long as people watched it, that was fine. Everybody was really, you know, free. There were community guidelines, but those were very clear and very basic. You know, basically no sex, no violence, no blood. But if you kept, you know, that, then you could do anything you wanted. And uh, you got paid for it. You know, everybody could just get paid for it. Every, there was no limit of, you know, every channel, if you just needed to activate a little that little check mark and then you were making money with the YouTube channel. And that changed in 2017, where YouTube started to really control, inspect each and every video on there. Mm -hmm. and the new, newly uploaded stuff, but also the stuff that was on there sometimes for years. And they would demonetize it, they would shadow ban it, this means they would hide it from the audience. 
and they just did this to please their advertisers mm -hmm. because advertisers had been you know they complained because they would find like a coca-cola would find a coca-cola commercial next to a beheading video of isis you know mm -hmm. so and they said they can't accept this and 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 then youtube reacted to the pressure from them mm -hmm. and said okay from now on we're gonna heavily moderate this and we only we may make sure that your uh, ads will only show up next to family friendly videos and for a lot of creators that was like the end of the road a lot of creators because at that point you know you could do a lot of things on youtube that you could never do on television that's why it was so easy to become famous on youtube you know you could do stuff that people wanted to see because it was wild and crazy whereas on tv you needed to play by the book always <laughs> so so and that ended and I think it made YouTube a much more boring place than it is right now. Mm -hmm. But it also destroyed a lot of careers. Mm -hmm. And I said, that is not right. YouTube cannot really first motivate these guys to give up their jobs and lure them into becoming a professional creator. And then, then you know, just pulling the rug from underneath their feet and, and completely ruin them. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of suffering there. And still is to this day, but the change was like most drastic. And so I said that, it, you know, we are helpless. YouTube creators are, of course, completely helpless against the power of YouTube. So we had three parties, four, if you want to, the audience, and then we had the creators, and then we had advertisers and YouTube. And the YouTubers, the creators were completely on their own. They couldn't really, they had no power, mm -hmm. no, no power. So I, I said, it's a classic situation where we need a union so that the creators can unify because after all, without the creators, YouTube would be nothing. So right. no content. Yeah. So so I decided to start this YouTubers union, and I had a lot of people that wanted to join, and we really moved things. And then I I teamed up with the IG Metal, which is the largest independent uh, trade union in the world. Mm -hmm. Of course, there was a, it's the German organization, and they very much went into the gig economy. And, and try to fight for any kind of, you know, self-employed Uber drivers, you know, but also YouTubers and Instagrammers and all this. And they try to, to and also like pizza delivery guys, you know, all these, everybody who is self-employed, but very much depending on a big a company that, that dictates the rules. So, but this, you know, this problem of being demonetized, really, this is all driven from the fact that advertisers just don't want their ads next to this content, right? So what is the actual demand that you would want to make to YouTube is to for them to push back on the advertisers and say, no, too bad, we're going to run the ads in front of the videos anyways, or like, you know, like, what is what, what was the goal? I think the money needs to be distributed in a different way. I think that it is absolutely wrong to say that all these videos that cannot be monetized because they're not kind of delectable for advertisers, mm -hmm. that they are worthless to the platform mm -hmm. because they keep people on the platform. So if you make a piece of video that gets millions of views, people are on the platform and they can present all the other videos that have commercials to these guys, right? Mm -hmm. Without these really interesting and attractive videos, the platform wouldn't be what it is people would watch that content somewhere else right where it is still monetized mm -hmm. or they would stop making it altogether because they can't make a living out of it anymore so i think that the money that is currently split two ways between youtube and the creators that have you know videos that that are monetized mm -hmm. i think they also need to take a third of the money and give it to creators that make videos that simply keep people on the platform mm. even though they may not be monetized they're not worthless i think that would be more fair and because that's basically what happened is that previously everybody got money and then all this money went to the people with family friendly content so for those guys that made like asmr videos <laughs> what, mm. or toy unboxing videos they ended up making a ton of money much more than they used to make and I think that's simply unfair. Mm -hmm. So so I, I believe that it's just a money split mm -hmm. and everybody would then be happy because the advertisers would not see their ads against videos that they don't want, but everybody would still get paid and everybody would still have a chance. So that was my basic demand. Yeah, I would think now they have a YouTube premium product too, where it kind of 
cuts advertisers out of the picture anyways. So you would think, especially now, they, you know, they could take that out of the equation. If people are watching your videos, regardless of what the content is, that's where they're seeing the value of their $10 or whatever they pay per month. But it's not enough people that pay for the premium. Yeah. Oh, you, I can see this on my income only about, and I have controversial, you know, uh, stuff. So ma many of my videos are demonetized. Mm -hmm. Still, I only make about 5% of my income from YouTube premium mm -hmm. and 95% from those videos that are monetized. Yeah. So, and, and so for people that have, uh, that have uh, content that is even, you know, harm that is really harmless, that is even different. Mm -hmm. They have maybe 2% of the income from premium mm -hmm. and the rest is from the, from the other videos. Yeah. So that is, um, it, and also don't forget that currently YouTube is shadow banning all the unmonetized videos. So why, and that's, it makes sense in the short run. Why would you suggest a video where you're not making money on as a platform, right? You would suggest the, the, the monetized content. And that means that a lot of the guys that have unmonetized videos are feeling that their videos can't go anywhere anymore saying the subs subscribers are not notified anymore when they upload a new video and um, they not you know, recommend it to the people like they used to be. So th this is what they call shadow banning. You know? So the video is still there and it looks like it's fine, but it doesn't get any more views. Yeah. So Do you have any views on the, um, the overall effect of social media on society? Do you think society is net better because of it, net worse? Obviously, you're somebody who benefits from it. Well, first of all, even though I have issues with YouTube, I'm still immensely grateful for what they've done for me mm -hmm. since they gave me a stage. Without YouTube, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have that stage. So even though I struggle with a lot of their decisions, I really have to say that I'm, I'm still a YouTuber by heart. I love the platform and, and therefore my suggestions are not right. I don't want to bring the platform down or so on. Mm -hmm. I want to find a way that makes everybody more happy than than now so and i also am afraid that youtube if they're not going to change their policies they will lose traction and we already see that TikTok is actually winning big time against youtube and that is also because they have a different approach and i think youtube needs to develop otherwise they will lose reach you know so but in general people now saying influence or this is also new but i don't really think so i mean think about it we always had rock stars, right? Mm -hmm. We always had famous people like Mozart was an influencer and a rock star in his time. And people tried to close like, you know, by, by his clothes, play his songs, you know, replicate his style. So I think we always had influencers, you know? I mean, even when in the days where we didn't have any radio and television, there have been famous writers that have been writing very successful books. Lots of people idolize those people, you know. So, so I think it's that is not new. I think we always had this. Mm -hmm. it, what is different is now that now everybody can be a rock star. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was wasn't the case before. Mm -hmm. I mean, even even if I think back to my youth, like in the eighties, and that was before the internet was round. If you wanted to be successful in music, you had to get a, a, a record contract. Mm -hmm. If you didn't get that one, there was no way that you could ever be famous, right? You could play music in your garage for as long as you wanted to. And even if it was really good, chances are nobody's ever going to know you. Mm -hmm. And that has changed. And now people, because of all these platforms, can build a reach by themselves without signing up to any kind of, you know, contract, record company, whatever. They don't need to be discovered by a big corporation. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a major change. And I think it's actually very good for society, even though it does have negative side effects too. No question about that. What about the, uh, I think this is probably more prevalent on like Twitter and Facebook, but the like amplification of outrage, you know, it kind of seems like, and, and we, I, I believe we see this more in the US, maybe then in Germany. I don't know what it's like over there, but um, it seems like the most like divisive and controversial takes tend to attract more attention and therefore these platforms are sort of incentivized to um, show more of that because 
outrage tends to keep people on the platform longer. So do you view YouTube as part of that or do you think YouTube's kind of in a separate bucket? Well, first of all, YouTube these days is heavily moderated. Mm -hmm. So like hate speech and so on has no chance on the platform. Mm -hmm. All those really loud people are banned on the platform, so mm -hmm. they are no longer around. And mm -hmm. I think they have a hard time. It's actually a part of, you know, it's, it's actually getting so bad that a lot of people say it's cancel culture. Mm -hmm. If you say anything controversial, mm -hmm. if you're not swimming with the mainstream, you very quickly find yourself in a position where people want to silence you. Yeah. Quite effectively so, right? So, so I'm not completely okay with that because freedom of speech, I think, is an important part of our society too, right? Yeah. So, but on the other hand, I also don't really like people that, you know, force others to, you know, commit crimes and, and really, you know, go into riots and so on. I don't think that this is right too. So there must be a balance between the extremes. So that freedom of speech is still a thing. And on the other hand, people cannot, you know, do go crazy on whatever they do. So, uh, but it's, it's not an easy decision and the balance is, is finely tuned right now. I'm unable to say if it's so bad or not. I mean, I can see that some of these people are really, really, really in trouble now that, you know, the big loud mouths mm -hmm. are really in trouble now. Yeah. On the other hand, some people can do what they want. You know, I see people like Andrew Tate, who is very successful on TikTok and so on, really successful, who has really, really strong points of views regarding feminism and regarding, you know, male dominance and so on. And a lot of people follow him just because what he says is so drastic. Mm -hmm. And people like the drama. And they always like the drama. And, and this is also not new. I mean, look at German history. You know, when, when the Nazis came to power, they were very drastic before that. Mm -hmm. what, they, what they later did was no surprise because that's what they told everyone they would do. Mm -hmm. So it's just that... It, it is hard to say. I mean, they're very hard to judge from the outside to say what is what is going on in our society right now. Mm -hmm. As I said, it has to be a balance, but I'm not the one who decides if we have too much of this or not enough. You make a lot of YouTube videos. Uh, I, you know, as someone, like I used to make YouTube videos a lot more uh, back in my Megabots days. And um, it's really amazing to see you crank out. I mean, sometimes you'll do three videos a week. I don't know if you're actually filming three videos a week, but you upload three times a week sometimes. Um, what is the, I guess, what's the fire in your belly that keeps you motivated to keep uploading YouTube videos? I know a lot of people, they just get burned out. They get lazy, disinterested, whatever it may be, depressed because they read the comments. Is there some secret you have? If you watch my videos, there are different types. So uh, my favorite types is when I invented something and I can show it off to people for the first time. Mm -hmm. I'm really, it, it really burns a fire in me. I really want to do this. I want to show it and I want to see people's reaction. I can't wait to see what people say about it. So when I'm making a new invention and I build a new thing that really works well, I'm immensely proud and that makes me so happy to upload a video about it that I'm actually, I'm anticipating this so much that I can't wait to get the video done. And then there's also some videos that I don't really appreciate so much. Basically, for example, if it's a sponsored video and I have to do this and I really don't want to. Uh, or sometimes when, uh, when there is a, a critical topic that I need to talk about. And that also happens sometimes. We are in crazy times and sometimes I just feel I need to do that. So this is very different so some of these videos are pretty painful to make mm -hmm. and I don't really enjoy it very much. But whenever it comes to something that I made, I built, I love showing it. Mm -hmm. So, and that is really the fun part of it. To this day, it hasn't changed. Yeah. 14 years and you still love showing people what you've built. Exactly. And I've been getting better over these 14 years. If I look back at my early designs and constructions, oh my. Yeah. <laughs> People love your uh, your laugh and your booming voice. Um, has this like always been a characteristic of you? Have, has everybody just kind of like always enjoyed this? Or when did you realize this was kind of like a, um, I don't know. It's certainly part of your persona on YouTube. Has this been something you kind of played up 
before in the past or not really? Personally, I was always like this. Yeah. But in the early videos, you see that I'm not doing that mm -hmm. because I was trying to behave like in a sober fashion and so on. And then in later videos, I quickly relaxed and letting my real self out. So what you see in these videos is the real Jörg Sprabe. I'm not actually acting. Yeah. I'm probably a really bad actor. <laughs> so, 100% authentic. Yes. Good, good to hear. Good to hear. I know you're married and your wife doesn't make, I don't think, any appearances on your YouTube channel. Does she just not care about the weapons? Um, what does she think? Does she... Do you go shooting together at all, or does she just have her own separate hobbies, or what's the story there? Well, my wife isn't anti-gun, but she also doesn't really like guns very much. For her, these things are, you know, a little weird. She, she, she doesn't, she wouldn't really be interested in shooting any weapon, right? So she's just, and but she also has her own career. She's a medical doctor and renowned researcher in a university hospital, so she has enough on her plate. And it's also a thing that my reputation could be dangerous for her career, I have to say it. So if she would make appearances in my video, the, a lot of the, her colleagues would not take her serious anymore. You know? so, you, so you need to be careful with these things. So we try to not mix up her career and mine. We try to keep it nicely separated. Although I have to say, in my job, it's good to have a doctor close by. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to um, talk about that too. I saw you posted maybe on your Facebook, like a post on Quora, like a documentation of all the injuries you've had. Most notably, I think you hit yourself in the eye with a slingshot and lost some functionality of like the pupil. Tell us about that. And if it's, I don't know, did it make you question what you were doing at all? Or how did that affect your youtube career or is it just something you just accept as part of the part of the business and you just keep going yeah well when it happened that was really early i mean that happened i think in 2010 maybe so someone sent me a slingshot that he built and i just basically pulled it out against the, you know against the light and one of the bands snapped and, and and lashed out and there was not even a bullet in this it was just a rubber band that hit me in the eye and my eye immediately filled up with blood and I was completely blind on that eye for a while. And then when it recovered a little bit, you could see that the iris muscle was hurt and cut. And at some point also they had to replace my lens just because it was kind of fogging up because from the hit. And um, so to this day, the right eye is not the same as the left one. You know, I need really strong reading glasses because of the artificial lens in it. And also, there's still blood in my eyeball that I see swimming, like, you know, <laughs> like worms in my eye sight. So it will never be the same. Uh, did it stop me from, from the slingshot hobby? Not really, no. I just accepted that this was stupid, you know, that I did something wrong. And I learned from it and no longer draw out slingshots that way. Yeah. So now when you see me drawing out a slingshot, you would see that I draw it out in like in chest height. Right? Not, not towards my eye anymore. I don't do that because it's too dangerous. It's, it's really the eye is a really vulnerable part of the human body. And everything else that happens, just, you know, some blood on my fingers and hands and so on, who cares? You know, these things heal, nothing, nothing really happens. Let's talk about Go Gun, which in the scheme of your story is a relatively new endeavor. It's an e-commerce company. And you sell some of these weapons um, that you developed on your YouTube channel, that you've brought your fans along with you and created, you know, real products with them. Can you give some sense of scale of how big the business has grown for you? Number of products shipped or number of customers or revenue or anything like that? Well, I'm, this is a German corporation and, you know, you can see all the numbers of German corporations online. So a lot of the numbers are not a secret. Right? We're... Last year we did about 10 million euros in sales and I think we did anything between two and a half and three million euros in profits before taxes mm -hmm. and this year will be much better. This year, will, depending on how many of the, of the goods we can still ship you know, so that arrive on time to be sold this year, we probably end up between anything between 15 and 18 million euros in sales 
and hopefully almost maybe between four and five million euros in profit. So it's a really profitable company. Yeah. And it's grown so quickly. It's, it seems like every year it's basically doubled since its inception. Yeah, but I have to say that we really started in 2013. Mm. And that was like a, that was not a corporation at that time. The corporation only started, I think, in 2017. So when it was getting really serious. But in the beginning, I, I never expected it to become so big, I have to say. And I didn't start it with the intention to one day live from, from its sales. Mm -hmm. When I started it in 2013, it, remember, we are in the golden days of YouTube, and I was yeah. making good money on YouTube, and was really not thinking that I need anything. But I had so many people that wanted to buy a slingshot from me. Can I buy a slingshot from you? And, and then I had a friend who was already in his late 50s and he was lose, he lost his job and um, he didn't get he didn't wasn't able to find another job late, late in his life. And I said, well, if you want to, you can sell slingshots. you know I'm, I'm not sure how much money you can make with this, maybe not enough to live on, but if you have nothing else to do, you might as well give that a try. So I designed a slingshot and then we, there was an, we, we made an injection molding tool for it. And we started to sell it, the Rambo, and you can still buy it today. Still a really good slingshot. And that's how it all started, you know, and very small. First years, we sold it like a few hundred of these slingshots, and that was it. And then, then it started to grow very seriously. And, um, and, but it was, really, it was really then the fact that I was also doing a lot of product reviews for companies, like for crossbows and for air guns and so on that in, in more, more and more people just would ask me, okay, you gave us this glowing review, but there's no dealer in Germany. Would you not be interested also to be our dealer? Mm -hmm. And then we took on product after product after product, and that is actually responsible for this huge growth rate. I'm in the same industry as you, um, selling these products in North America. You know, you're selling weapons. At, if you sell enough, at some point, somebody's going to get hurt with one of these. Uh, or you know maybe use them for the wrong purposes. How do you how do you think about that, or do you not think about that? Well, I do think about it, and I I think everybody who sells dangerous items needs to look at that part of the business too. So I was asking myself if I'm ready to accept that kind of a side effect, you know, of selling weapons, and I decided that I'm okay with it, that I can live with the fact that. Sooner or later, something will happen with a weapon that I have sold. Just like everyone who sells kitchen knives also has a certain risk. And if you sell cars, you have the same thing. Now, weapons, of course, serve a purpose. You know, tactical weapons that we sell serve a purpose to be dangerous for human beings. Most of the stuff that we're selling is not sporting goods, but it's, it's really for self-defense. So s someday, I'm sure, if it hasn't happened already, and I don't know of it, but might have happened or it will happen someday something will happen on the other hand it might also save lives because if people use it for defending themselves it might save lives too i i for me i came up with the uh, decision that i'm okay with it and i can live with that effect mm -hmm. but everybody who is into selling guns needs to needs to look at that i believe yeah yeah i think one of the positives at least for me is that even if they're not used at all, they can give people a sense of security that they might not have otherwise. Just just knowing that they have a tool there that you know is there for them that they could use in a certain situation if push comes to shove. You know, if you pick up the phone and dial nine one one or call the police, they're not going to be there fast enough to correct, you know, some kind of extreme situation. So, you know, even if they're, you know, again, it's like if, if they're never even used, at least it can help somebody sleep at night and put their mind at ease. Like that's how yeah, I think yeah, of it. Yeah, peace of mind is an important part. I also should say that our typical customer is law abiding. Otherwise, you wouldn't buy our legal products yeah. because you could easily buy, you know, illegal things that are much more powerful, much more dangerous, much more concealable. So I think that a lot of people who really intend to do illegal stuff with weapons, they would not go and buy our products. They right. would not go buy a repeating crossbow or bow or something. Most of the people that buy our stuff want something to defend themselves, 
you know, in a really dire situation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I, I don't think it's likely that people will abuse it, but it's also not impossible. We have to realize it. Right? Yeah. It's possible. What makes a good weapon? <laughs> well, it, it depends on what kind of weapon it is and what you want to use it for. So if you want a weapon that is concealable and you can take it out, you know, to defend yourself on the streets, that you that requires different features mm -hmm. than if you want to defend your home, right? Mm -hmm. But in general, a good weapon needs to be uh, deadly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think, I don't like non-lethal weapons one bit because I think they're dangerous and they need to be uh, repeating. I don't think that a weapon that only has one shot is serious. First of all, because you can't do any warning shots, <laughs> but also what do you do if your one shot is gone? Yeah. <laughs> so then you have a, probably an opponent that is even more angry than he used to be. And it needs to be reliable and accurate. So, so these are the, the features that I believe a good weapon needs to have. We have some questions from fans. People want to know if you have a exercise or special diet that keeps you looking like the mountain from the Game of Thrones. Are you, uh, you work out a lot or are you just naturally, uh, naturally this way? I think I need to always take care of, in, you know, that I get enough beer <laughs> and meat. <laughs> no, no, seriously. I mean, I've been, I've been lifting weights all my life. Yeah. On and off, I have to say, because there's been phases in my life where I wasn't really able to, to spend that time, right? And then there was COVID, where for a long time there was no gym that you could go to. Mm -hmm. But I still try to really hit the gym as often as I can, and I'm still, for my 57 years now, I'm still really strong. I have a lot of body power, which is also a reason why I loved slingshots so much when I got back into it, because I have a lot of power and strength in my upper body, on the other hand, I'm really slow. I can't move, you know, I'm not, I'm, I can't do anything fast. I can't run fast. I can't jump far. I, I can't even throw well. But I can draw out a, a powerful bow and slingshot. And mm. it's fascinating to me how the simple materials can convert my slow strength into really high kinetic energy, into fast flying projectiles. So that is the part of the fascination. And uh, I, I still shoot slingshots a lot, even though I no longer make that many videos about them. Other than that, I, I think the gym is a wonderful place to keep you fit, even if you're getting older, since the, the, the risk of injuring yourself is very low compared to more active sports. Mm -hmm. So I'm a fan of gyms. Mm -hmm. If it's the end of the world with zombies and everything, if you must choose only one, which of your creations would you choose to be able to bring with you? If it's really a zombie apocalypse, then that is not an easy question because in the zombie ap apocalypse, you must you must assume at some point that you have no more resources. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's very tough to answer that one. Um, but if it goes to like, what do I think is like the ideal weapon for like a zombie apocalypse for these things, I would always go with either a re repeating crossbow or a repeating bow mm -hmm. because these weapons are silent these weapons uh, are solid. Um, you can always make your own bolts from wood and nails and all these things that you can find. And um, they don't require anything like gunpowder that might be very hard to find, even a slingshot. I mean, natural rubber doesn't last forever. So even if you have a slingshot, how are you going to replace the bands after a while? Mm -hmm. So I think a, a good repeating bow or crossbow would be a perfect choice, even though I do own a lot of firearms. Mm -hmm. But a firearm, first of all, if you run out of ammo, what's it worth? And I believe that in a true zombie apocalypse, ammo would be the new currency. Mm -hmm. who, would, who would be able to afford shooting ammo when you can get bread and everything for it? <laughs> yeah. So I think those, that, that would not really work. Plus, also, it's very loud. I mean, for a zombie, a gunshot is a dinner bell. So, <laughs> so that's, and I mean, of course, the zombie apocalypse probably won't happen. But on the other hand, shooting silently is a feature that in any kind of catastrophe you want. If you were king of the world, what laws would you introduce, abolish, or change? 
Uh, that's a good question. You know, I would have to think about this some more. But I know a few things that I believe the entire world is doing wrong right now. So, uh, I mean, in general changes, I mean, what a world government could do is, of course, they could end all wars. <laughs> that's, that's kind of clear you could do that. But I think one of the things that I really have to say is, is goes back to like climate change and everything. I think that this whole idea to better the world by going green on everything, by making everything electric and so on, is simply wrong. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that we need to save, we need to lower consumption. We cannot expect that we, if we replace all, car, all, all, all gas guzzling cars with, with electric cars that have twice the HP, I don't think that that's going to do anything because it's the second law of thermodynamics. You know, you can't put the boiling water that has evaporated back into the bottle. You can't do it, not if you're not willing to invest even more energy to do it. So I think that the world population needs to start saving energy. And that would probably mean that you can't you can't have you can't have a car with 400 HP anymore. You need to go back to a car that can probably consume two liters of of gas per hundred kilometer, like a fraction of what it's now taking. Mm -hmm. I, and I think people have to accept that these wasteful years are over if they really want to avoid climate change. If they really want to res you know reserve some of these energies for their children and grandchildren and and grand grandchildren. So I think it's a completely different uh, paradigm that we need to adopt if you really want to save the planet for a little longer. <laughs> so you would, so you're proposing limiting consumption, but in a way that it is acceptable to people, right? Mm -hmm. So if you give someone a, if you if you take the car away from someone and give him a, a bicycle, that is a very major step, and you know you would feel this very much. If you take someone's car who takes how many gallons per, you know, I don't know, and, and give him a car that's still a fine car, but that consumes much less gas mm -hmm. and it's also much less expensive to drive, right? Mm -hmm. That's probably a much more acceptable approach, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I would actually not make it illegal to, you know, drive a big car, but I would really make it affordable and inexpensive to drive a car that has a really low fuel consumption to give the industry strong incentives to develop such cars. Mm -hmm. See, when I was young, the typical car in Europe had 50 HP. And it was consuming about eight, nine liters of 400 kilometers. And now the typical average car has 200 HP. Yeah. And it's taking the same amount of gas. They could have developed this in a way that it would only take two liters of 400 kilometers and, and still have 50 HP. So these cars are move, you know, they are fast enough for everything that you want to do and, and, and they could consume a lot less fuel. And the same goes for many other things too, mm -hmm. for many other things too. We could actually, I think, save a lot of energy by just changing our lifestyle, but not in a way that we go back to caveman days, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so, but the world has to understand that this is the only alternative. We, we can't replace you know, fossil energy with wind energy and solar energy on the grand scale and think that this is going to work. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. It can't work. If you want to, if you want to reserve all this, everything that the earth has for a little while, lowering consumption is the only way how to achieve it. It's, it's an uncomfortable truth, but it has to be accepted. What about the promises of nuclear fission or fusion? I, Really, I think it's too dangerous. <laughs> I think it's too dangerous. We should not play with these things, at least not as long as it's not completely, completely developed. But just the experimental phase for it yeah. is so dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but other than that, maybe that is an option. I don't know. I, I'm not a scientist. I'm not, I'm not an expert enough to, to, to judge. I thought I saw a statistic or heard somewhere that there's only been like one person ever that's died from a nuclear power plant. But you know what the Soviet Union did to save Europe from being uninhabitable for 50,000 years? They asked 500,000 people to go in there with a shovel in the hand mm -hmm. and get rid of the radioactive rubble that they had there. Mm -hmm. 
and also make sure that that thing would not go off mm -hmm. by by actually uh, you know using manual labor to do this. All these people, five hundred thousand people, many many of those five hundred thousand people developed uh, cancer afterwards, and the Soviet Union never really rewarded them. But my wife grew up within 200 kilometers from that place and she knows how it was. I can tell you that this was horrible and that wasn't even the worst thing. I mean, they avoided the worst thing. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of country these days can persuade 500,000 citizens to, to bring that sacrifice? Right? Yeah. Today, that would not happen. People would China, run away. <laughs> so so if, if another accident like in Chernobyl happens these days, chances are a huge part of the world would be uninhabitable for many thousands of years. And that would change all of our lives forever. So we randomly escaped from that catastrophe just 50 years ago, not even 50 years ago. I don't think that we really should continue this development any further. Not if we don't have to, not if we can still save so much energy by being more careful on consumption side, quite frankly. We're living like kings. Every one of us lives like kings. Yeah. Imagine what kind of energy we are using every day. You know, so let's say you're sitting, you're watching TV on your brand new television with a really bright screen and you're charging your phones, you have your lights on, you prepare your dinner in your oven. You're talking easily 2000 kilowatts that you're consuming at one time. Now think about how many people on bicycles you would have to have in your basement to generate that much power. Basically, you would need at least 30 people 24 seven riding away on their bikes. So 30 slaves that work for you to just live your normal lifestyle. Yeah. We live like kings. Yeah. We need to go back and live like ordinary people. <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> you have a very interesting way of conducting business. And it's different than anyone I've ever worked with because um, we work together now. But you don't really believe in contracts or patents or lawyers. You just sort of make handshake agreements and keep yourself in a position where both parties are incentivized to work together. But they're, for the most part, very simple arrangements. How did you arrive at this somewhat contrarian method? There's some situations that, you know, made you learn that this is the way you like to operate or how did you end up in this spot? Well, first of all, I learned the hard way that lawyers are really expensive and the true value that they bring to a party is almost non-existent. Lawyers work in a way that if you sit down with someone and you basically have agreed with that person on the structure of a deal, they make it incredibly complicated because they come up with all kinds of you know, scenarios that may never happen that because they are so stupid and so unrealistic but they just blow up all these things to a degree, which is really crazy. And then, then, then you, you do this contract and you sign it, but how do you enforce it? With more lawyers and with more court sessions and so on. It's all completely useless, specifically in international business, since it's so costly to do anything in, in international business. You know, if you're not happy with what I do, you would have to sue me in Germany. I would have to sue you in the US. Good luck with that. Right? Mm -hmm. And the lawyers are gonna are gonna suck you dry if you try this. Make sure that nothing is left over when you're finished with it. I, I truly believe that a deal always must be good for both sides. And in case that is no longer the that is no longer the case, then this business ends, and you just have to part right mm -hmm. in you know good terms if at all possible. But if it doesn't work then there is no value in continuing this any further. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's the very honest way for me to make business, to conduct business. I refuse to do business with people that I don't have any trust in. Mm -hmm. I simply don't do it. I, I refuse to do it and if someone develops in a way that he's losing my trust, I end that business relationship. Very simple. Same goes for the patents, you know, patents I learned because I worked for large corporations too. The thing is that if, 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 if patents are, are no benefit for a small inventor, if you file for a patent, first of all, you're telling the world the nature of your invention. Everybody, you give them the blueprints, basically. They know how to copy it. Then second, you also have to have the money to defend that patent. So let's say it costs you 50,000 to file for the patent. 
for that patent, you have to invest at least 500,000 to defend it if someone attacks it. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have 500,000 to defend the patent, it's idiotic to file it in the first place. Since if you're not able to defend it, where is the value? A big company that looks into it would immediately try to find out how much money does this guy have. And if they come to the conclusion that you cannot afford to fight it, you know, they will attack it. So, so where is the value for a small inventor in filing a patent? Big corporations have a different reasoning for this. They have whole portfolios of patents and they use this as a protective shield against other corporations. They would say, if, if you don't leave me alone, I'm not going to attack you too with my patents. So therefore, like Sony and Panasonic and everybody, they would never attack each other since there's too many other patents on the other side. So they avoid these, these really costly lawsuits. But for a small inventor, a patent is a silly idea. Shouldn't do it. Has, has there been a specific time that you've been burned by lawyers or that comes to mind that you keep recalling where? Well, many times. Just, every time. I have to say that I didn't have a single time where I hired a lawyer to really settle a dispute that I was happy with the outcome. Typically what happens is that you come to some kind of foul compromise as suggested by a judge. And so you have to, you, you won't never get all of the money that you think you're entitled for. And then the legal bills hit you and then, you, you know, you realize you should have avoided it in the first place and just given up. So, so it's just, I don't, I don't have a single case where I said, I'm glad that I saw the lawyer before I did this. No. So I believe that lawyers for business are practically useless. I mean, I know that some of the guys out there are lawyers and that we will probably be very angry to hear this, yeah. but this is my personal experience. And, and therefore I would never hire a lawyer for settling a dispute. No. When, uh, we were negotiating a lot of entertainment contracts in the days of megabots. We had a phrase called the megabots compromise. And uh, that was basically when both parties ended up unhappy with the agreement they, they came up with. So we would negotiate, I don't know, licensing agreements and uh, representation agreements with talent agencies and stuff like that. And uh, at the end of the day, we would say, yeah, it's another megabots compromise. Both people are just unhappy. And then so. after that, let me ask you, there was actually all these contracts in the end turned out to be completely irrelevant, right? <laughs> yeah, for the most part. I mean, well, yeah, the business never uh, ultimately went bankrupt. So it's hard to really say if any particular contracts were that beneficial. Um, but But you could have written up these contracts way later when there was starting to be a relevance for them, right? Yeah, yeah. I think we tried to do, we tried to act like a company that was bigger than what it was and maybe in the process lost some authenticity and um, just kind of did things in the wrong uh, order. progression mm -hmm. order mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I think just focusing on um, YouTube content and doing it a little more um, cheaper lower production uh, would have served us pretty well I remember there was this one time we were we were running ads I didn't really know what I was doing but I was just putting a little bit of money towards uh, YouTube and I think I spent like I don't know, $5,000 or something on YouTube ads. And I saw that we were acquiring subscribers by just promoting some of our videos. We were acquiring like a subscriber for like 25 cents a subscriber. And now looking back, I really wish we would have taken all the money, like at least half the money we spent in, you know, fancy production companies and stuff like that and just putting it into YouTube ad spend because we could have taken a quarter million dollars and then immediately have a million subscribers on YouTube. Now, I don't know if those subscribers would have stuck around. Maybe they would have. I don't know. But that would have helped with the algorithm. Yeah, sure. it really seems like that was one of the biggest mistakes looking back, just like a, a tactical one instance mistake where if I could go back and do it over again, that would be one of the things that I would do over again that I think would maybe would have made the, the biggest difference. Although I have to say that 
uh, the difference between your business and my business is that you had external investors. Yeah. And external investors typically want all the legal issues to be bulletproof. Yeah, that's true. Otherwise, they would not give you the money. So yeah. if you have external investors, you typically cannot avoid all the yeah. legal issues and so on. And uh, that, during my attempt you know, to, at an IPO, I learned this the hard way too. Yeah. I mean, we had, you know what kind of KPMG charged us for all their work, for the evaluation and everything? It's millions, yeah. you know. Millions. We spend millions of, yeah. of hard-earned money on lawyers and and uh, auditors. Yeah. So and was it worth it? Of course not. Nothing ever came out of it. It was a waste of money. Yeah. There is something beautiful, I think, and um, maybe underrated in just owning a hundred percent of your company and <laughs> being able to call the shots. It is, but you need w big profit margins yes. to be that way yeah. because if you don't have enough profit margins you're gonna run out of money very quickly, even if you're successful, yeah. because of the necessary investments. You need to finance your own growth. Yeah. And you can only do this with really healthy margins. Yeah. Jorg, one last question. What advice would you give your 20-year-old self? My 20-year-old self? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a good question. Well, that is not easy to answer. Well, one thing, of course, is take it easy on the beers. <laughs> no, but it's. It, but I would really say, I would really say, what is really important is never, never deal with people that you don't trust. Mm -hmm. If you have a feeling that you don't trust someone, don't don't try to make it better by. You know, going writing up contracts and so on to make sure that this guy is not gonna cheat on you. Mm -hmm. The thing is that it the, the, you 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 like belly feeling, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a bad feeling about someone that wants to do it something wants to do a deal with you, get out. You know, don't do it. You know, just trust on on what your what your feelings say about a person and and avoid everyone else you know just just deal with people that you feel that are completely trustworthy and if i would have followed that advice i it would have saved me from a lot of pain yeah well uh it's been great working with you and uh i hope you trust me and i, I certainly do. trust you otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here <laughs> <laughs> it's been a great conversation and uh i appreciate you sitting down with me thanks All yeah right. it was fun I hope that you like my answers. No, that was great. <laughs>